It's good to see everyone here this evening. Thank you for being here. As you see on the screen, I want to address a topic that some will find it new to your ears, but it's been around quite a while. And it's never good to talk about it only after the problem pops up. Uh, it's best to address such things before those things ever get here. And I don't know, because some brethren operate behind the scenes and hold views that uh, are dangerous. Not, of course, no brother that holds the doctrine ever thinks that it's dangerous, but nevertheless, by the end of this lesson tonight, I hope that you will be able to see why this was needed and why this is an important topic to cover, and I hope that your understanding of it will, will be better, and I intend to make it as simple as I can. And at the bottom of the screen, as you see, on the, I have a website that's listed. It's called ICI, or ECIconference.com. You can go to the website and get more information from that website, but you have to go to the archives, pull down the little menu of archives, and then it'll get you to 2011 uh, in which this topic was discussed. A lot of other topics are on that site, but that will also give you a lot of information that will help you if you want to dive deeper into this and get a more thorough understanding of this topic. I'm going to highlight the things that I think are the most important and crucial, and I think that as we go along, you will see why this becomes a, uh, why it's a very dangerous topic. In about 2008, uh, I engaged in a written debate with a preacher. I didn't realize what was behind the scenes, but it was simple. He believed that the law of Moses ended at the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And I said, uh, no, as far as I can tell from the Bible, it looks to me like that the law of Moses came to a close at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, that's when the law of Moses came to a conclusion. And as we engage in, in that uh, written debate... <clears throat> I began to realize that uh, there's more to it than just saying something happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. It's all tied together in a big doctrine that I'm going to call the AD 70 doctrine. Otherwise, it's known as realized eschatology. Don't let that scare you because I'm going to explain that in just a moment so that it will be simple. But the AD 70 doctrine makes everything hinge on what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, some things did happen. A lot of things happened in the destruction of Jerusalem. And it is a crucial thing. But everything didn't happen in the destruction of Jerusalem. And so I want to make that clear as we go along. So I'd like to begin by defining the terms. When you can define the terms, you've, you've, you've pretty well succeeded in understanding the doctrine and what is wrong with that doctrine. Realize eschatology is just big words based on a Greek word. And uh, that word eschatology comes from two Greek words that mean uh, last, eschatos or eschaton in the Greek and logia, logia in the Greek, which usually is the word logos. You've probably seen that word. That's always the Greek word for words or study, study of words. So, so realize eschatology is a study of things that happen at the last. Uh, let me simplify it. It's the study of things that happen last. Of course, that, that involves the second coming of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about uh, when he comes, he will deliver up the kingdom. So he's coming. 
And he'll deliver up the kingdom to the Father. We'll look at that in more detail in just a moment. But that's one of the last things that the Bible talks about. It's also the time of resurrection. Let's just look at a few passages that connect the resurrection to last things. Turning to the book of John, look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6, notice with me verse uh, 39. John 6 verse 39 he says, this, will, this is the will of the Father who sent me that all, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing but raise it up at the last day. There's, so the resurrection, raising up, takes place at the last day. And there's our word eschaton, last all right. Again, drop them down to verse forty. He says, "Of this is the will of this is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day." There's our word again, eschaton. Resurrection is one of the last things. Then in verse. 44, again, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father has sent me. I will raise him up at the last day. And then again in verse 54 of this chapter, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood as eternal life, and I will raise him up at the eschaton day, the last day. All right, so resurrection fits with the last things, doesn't it? And the day of judgment in John 12, verse 48, the words that I speak, the same will judge you in the last day. There's our word again, eschaton. So we've got the word now in our mind. Hopefully we understand then that when you're talking about realized eschatology, let's go to the first word of that. Realized means that these brethren believe that the resurrection and the last judgment and the second coming of Christ has already been realized. It has happened. And they believe that it happened in A.D. 70. It's not future anymore. When you put it all at A.D. 70, you say it came to be realized in A.D. 70. It's not future anymore. There is no future judgment. There is no future resurrection, there is no final day of judgment. That all happened to these brethren. It all happened in A.D. 70. So now we understand our terms. Now, looking at, well, why did they believe that? Why are brethren convinced that these things happened then? I want to clarify this a little more. The A.D. 70 doctrine is not... Let's get this in mind. It is not believing that the destruction of Jerusalem is a key event. Now, I believe that destruction of Jerusalem is a key event, but that's not the AD 70 doctrine that we have concern about. Jesus believed that the destruction of Jerusalem was a key event. Uh, uh, so it's not believing that the destruction of Jerusalem is a key event. It is. It is not believing that certain books were written before A.D. 70 and find fulfillment in A.D. 70. You can believe that every book of the New Testament was written before the destruction of Jerusalem and still not be a person who believes that the final judgment took place, that the resurrection took place, that the second coming of Jesus Christ took place in A.D. 70. You see, so it's not believing that certain books were written before the destruction of Jerusalem. Some brethren get alarmed at that, that uh, if you mention this book was written before the destruction of Jerusalem, they get up in there. That's the A.D. 70 doctrine. That's not the A.D. 70 doctrine. The A.D. 70 doctrine is believing that all the last things that the Bible say were going to happen in the last day occurred in A.D. 70. 
They believe that the final coming of Jesus occurred in A.D. 70, that the resurrection from the dead occurred in A.D. 70, that the final judgment happened in A.D. 70, and that's the A.D. 70 doctrine. I hope that we are clear as to what it is not, and we're now clear on to what it is. Now, this is not a new deception. It is a deception, but it is not a new one. I'm turning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to notice with me that there were brethren even before the destruction of Jerusalem who believed that the resurrection was past already. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 16. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16. Paul warns Timothy, he says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. He mentions two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. They're teaching something. Their teaching spreads like a cancer. When something spreads like a cancer, it takes a grip on your soul, on your mind, on your heart. And it ruins you. Well, what did they teach? Verse 18. They have strayed concerning the truth, saying... That the resurrection is already past. And they overthrow the faith of some. So if you believe that the resurrection is past, that would overthrow the faith of a lot of brethren, would it not? And it would be a cancer. Even today, that would be a cancer if the resurrection hasn't already occurred. And if the Judgment Day hasn't occurred, but some brethren start teaching that it has, that would overthrow a lot of faith. So it is a dangerous doctrine. It was dangerous then, and it would be dangerous, just as dangerous now. And Paul says so. So we can't ignore it. Just because we've never heard of it doesn't mean that we don't need to hear about it in advance and think about it before it gets here. Now, I have to admit, as I did just previously and just a moment ago, I said that that doctrine, that the uh, resurrection is past already, was being circulated even before the destruction of Jerusalem. So, with that in mind, well, that might lend to somebody thinking that, well, they got it wrong then, but it becomes right when Jerusalem was destroyed. Well, this was before the destruction of Jerusalem, but it doesn't make it any more valid since the destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem was indeed a coming of the Lord. No doubt about that. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus described it as Him coming. And it would be Him coming in a judgment on Jerusalem. And so, yes, it was a coming of the Lord. And it was a judgment day upon the Jews. It wasn't the final judgment. And it wasn't the final coming of the Lord, but it was a coming. It was very similar, for example, in Isaiah chapter 13, where he talks about the coming destruction of Babylon. Isaiah 13 uses the very language Jesus used in Matthew 24. And in talking about the fall of Babylon, he says, this is a coming of the Lord. He even said, the end is coming. But that wasn't the end of the world. That was the end of Babylon. That wasn't the judgment of the whole world. That was the judgment on Babylon. That was not the final coming of the Lord. It was a coming, but it wasn't the same kind of coming. So we need to be able to distinguish between those things. The destruction of Jerusalem was indeed a coming of the Lord. It wasn't the final coming. It was indeed a judgment 
God brought down upon them to destroy them. But it wasn't the final judgment, as we'll see in just a moment. So even though Hymenaeus and Philetus began to talk about the resurrection being passed already, some brethren began to say, well, they were, they were wrong then, but after the destruction of Jerusalem, you would have to say all of that occurred in A.D. 70. Well, that doesn't fit what the Bible shows. And I want to demonstrate that that is the case by looking at some key passages. Now, just to demonstrate, I'm not, I'm not bringing this up as if it was something way out there. No, it's, it's real close. It's getting closer. There are brethren that are entertaining these thoughts in closer Closer to us, regions closer to us than you might realize. Max King wrote a book called The Spirit of Prophecy, and it became very popular back in the 70s. So this doctrine has been around. It was called Max Kingism back then. It began to be labeled differently, and recent years began to be called realized eschatology. But no matter what the name is, the doctrine is still the same. And here's what he said. In that book on page 105, he says, There is no scriptural basis for extending the second coming of Christ beyond the fall of Judaism. That is, when you think about the second coming of Christ, there's no reason to look beyond A.D. 70. When Judaism fell. Or on page 81, he says, the end of the Jewish world was the, was the second coming of Christ. When did the Jewish world, as they knew it, come to an end? Well, it came to end when the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. The priesthood was lost. Judaism, as they had known it, was vanquished. And has not returned and will not return. That's why they're trying so desperately to take hold of Jerusalem and make sure that they have access to rebuilding that temple. They want to, but in all of these years they haven't been able to rebuild the temple. And even if they could rebuild the temple, they cannot establish that their Levitical lineage is intact. To put the priesthood doing their duties in the temple. So this, this doctrine, although it seems like it might be some mysterious thing way out there, is getting, getting a hold. Max King had a debate with Brother Nichols in which he affirmed the, this. The Holy Scriptures teach the second coming of Christ, including... The establishment of the eternal kingdom. And we've got the kingdom and then we've got the kingdom going to be realized in an eternal way. All right, so they say the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, the day of judgment and the end of the world and the resurrection of the dead occurred, past tense, with the fall of Judaism in A.D. 70. Now... Let's look at the scriptures and see what is wrong with this doctrine. Yes, indeed, you can take some scriptures and some of them will talk about the fall of Jerusalem as the coming of the Lord. No doubt about that. And there are things that would lend itself to believe that that this was a judgment that came upon Jerusalem. But what doesn't fit are a lot of things. And here are some of those things that just does not fit. Letting the second coming of Christ only be the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. In Matthew 25, you remember Jesus saying that in the great judgment day, there would be the gathering of All the nations. Matthew chapter 25 verse 31. 
all the nations. And uh, then he sat on the throne of his glory and all the nations were before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And some of these brethren want that to fit the destruction of Jerusalem. But that was not a judgment in which God gathered all the nations and started separating out of all the nations the ones that were going to be lost and those that were going to be saved. That was a judgment upon Judaism, unbelieving Judaism, but it wasn't a judgment that in which God gathered all the nations together and then started separating them out. So there is a coming, a judgment, in which all the nations will be gathered. Jesus talked about his coming in this way, or at least the angels who stood with the apostles when Jesus literally went back up. They were looking as he went back up into the sky in Acts 1. They saw him ascend up into the air. The angels that were with them said, well, why do you gaze up in there? This same Jesus that you saw go up into the air is going to come again in like manner. That is, he's going to come back the same way you saw him leave. So that's a literal coming. A spiritual coming would be like coming upon Babylon. Where you don't see him literally, but you see his handiwork in that. You see that that's his judgment coming down upon them. Or his coming upon Jerusalem in AD 70, that would be a coming. But that's not the same kind of him literally coming back in the clouds like you saw him leave. leave. So he is coming the same way. That he left. He's coming back in the clouds. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul describes it with these words. And in describing it this way, there is audible sound, visible things going on, something that is unmistakable. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, starting with verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. He's going to bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, verse 15, That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. There will be no mistake about it. You're going to see him come in the same manner you saw him leave. Except when he comes, there's going to be this shout. And with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And he goes on to say, comfort one another with these words. And he talks in chapter 5 further about this coming. It's going to be like a thief in the night in which you might... Say everything's going on fine. I don't see any reason to think he's coming back right now. And then he's going to surprise us and catch some people off guard. But the coming is going to be personal. It's going to be audible. And it is going to be visible. And that's going to be the end because there will be nothing else after that. Well, another thing that you find out in these scriptures... We mentioned John 12, 48, when he says that he will judge us in the last day. First Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians chapter, two, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, says that uh, he, uh, well, let me back up to verse 6. Since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, 
And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And let me make this point. To the Thessalonians, he's not saying this is just going to happen to the Jews. Now, what happened in AD 70 was a judgment upon the Jews. But this is coming in flaming fire and is taking on vengeance on those who do not know God. That will take care of anybody who does not know God. On those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all of those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. See, he's coming to punish the ungodly and there will be no escape from that judgment. Many Jews did escape the destruction of Jerusalem and all nations were not judged then. But the word of the Lord is going to judge us all in the last day. He's coming to destroy the heavens. First, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 now. 2 Peter chapter 3 and starting, drop down to about verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3 starting with verse 8. Now he's already talked about preserving the world. So the world that he had preserved from the flood is the same world that he's going to be talking about here. Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are therein will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, all of these things will be dissolved, This is the same world that was preserved uh, in the flood. This is the same world that's going to be melted with fervent heat when he comes. This is a judgment to destroy the heavens and the earth. And so all of the earth and its works and the elements, all of that will be destroyed. This just does not fit. A limited judgment upon Jews, and that's all he's concerned. In fact, he's not writing to just Jews in 2 Peter. He's not telling the Christians that this this is just going to happen to the Jews that are caught there in Jerusalem. But he's talking about a world calamity in this particular case. And it doesn't fit the resurrection. The resurrection, we have in the passages that we've read so far, passages that show us a resurrection that does not fit A.D. 70. Now I realize that in a sense there is a resurrection in the destruction of Jerusalem. What it does is like when we are baptized, we are raised up together with him. That's a kind of a resurrection, is it not? And in the destruction of Jerusalem, there was a separation where Christianity was elevated. And so being elevated, being lifted up, that's a kind of a resurrection. And so some of the brethren will say that's the kind of resurrection. That's the only kind of resurrection they see in this passage or in the Bible. Well, here are some problems with that. There is a resurrection that Jesus says is going to involve all who are in in their tombs. 
John chapter 5, 28 and 29. All who are in the tombs. He's not talking about a spiritual resurrection of uh, being elevated. But he's talking about everybody, both evil and bad, are going to be raised up. And in that resurrection, they're raised, they're, they're taken out of their graves. And some are raised to everlasting destruction. And some are raised to everlasting life. So there is a resurrection that just doesn't fit AD 70 resurrection. Is a resurrection of the righteous on the, uh, on the last day that we saw in John 6. It is a resurrection, though, that ends something that was very valuable up until that point. And so I'd like to call your attention to Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, in this great, dis- uh, great discussion that Jesus had with the, with the Sadducees, I want you to notice with me what Jesus said happens at this resurrection. So I'm looking now in verse 23, Matthew 22, verse 23. He says, the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. See, that false doctrine was circulated pretty early. And they say there is no resurrection. They came to him and asked him, saying, teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother." So they're thinking, we're going to trap Jesus now. They said, now, there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Now, here's their trick question. They think they've got him. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? Well, they all had her. That really complicates your resurrection teaching. And Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. You don't know the scriptures, nor the power of God. And he explains... For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. You don't marry after that. So you don't have to worry about whose wife she's going to be in the resurrection. There is not going to be marriage on the other side. But he says that they will be as the angels of God in heaven. So... Jesus believed that the resurrection ends all marriage and it ends all death. So that was not a problem for Jesus. But the resurrection should have ended all marriage. Well, what's going on today? Last night we saw a marriage. What's going on? Well, the resurrection hasn't happened. That's what's happened. The resurrection that Jesus talked about hasn't occurred yet because when it occurs, there won't be any marriage anymore. So it ought to be self-evident, shouldn't it? That if the resurrection occurred, there should not be any further life on this earth. There should be no further marriages going on. And that's the reason it's going on is because the resurrection that Jesus talked about in John 5 and in other places is not just being elevated above the destroyed Jews in A.D. 70. And Paul preached in, in Acts chapter 17, the judgment day is coming as just as sure as it can be and everybody's got to get ready for it. And he's not saying to the men at, at Athens, Greece, you've got to get ready for the judgment that's coming upon Jerusalem. No, you've got to get ready for the judgment in general. And everybody has to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world. And he's going to judge us 
by Jesus Christ. He assures, of the, uh, assures us of this by raising him from the dead. So there, that doesn't fit the A.D. 70 so-called resurrection. And one other point on that one. It is a resurrection of the just and the unjust, Acts 24, 15. It's not just the church being raised up and elevated above Judaism. It is a resurrection of the just and the unjust, Paul preached. That's the only one that goes beyond the destruction of Jerusalem. It's the one that hasn't happened yet. Now, in conclusion, this is my final slide, but there are several key points that I want you to see on this. And that is, to me, as I've studied this particular doctrine, this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the most troublesome passage for those who teach that the resurrection has already taken place. Now, there are several things in this chapter that to me is a death knell to this entire doctrine. It is one of the most difficult to them. They try to explain it away. And they try to, uh, to manipulate some things and make it fit their doctrine. But it just doesn't fit. It will not fit. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. After talking about, we can be assured that we're going to be raised because Jesus is the first fruits of those who will be raised. Being the first fruits means there's going to be others like His. His is the first fruits, and then the others are going to follow later. His is the one that's going to be copied by the others. When you have first fruits that come on in a season, you get the first of the ripened grapes or apples or whatever it is that you're picking, and you find that that's the first one, and there's going to be more that's going to follow a little bit later on. Well, this is what you have in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection, and incidentally, his body was raised from the tomb. His was a bodily resurrection. And so it is one that is going to be like His for it to be first fruits. Now, look with me in verse 24. The kingdom is going to be delivered. Starting with verse 20, for example. Uh, now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. So the rest of us are going to be raised when he comes. Now what the AD 70 says, well that happened in AD 70. That Christ came and that's when the resurrection took place. Not so fast. Look at verse 24. Then, that is when he comes and this resurrection takes place. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. When is he going to do that? When he comes. There won't be any more rule. There won't be any more thought, uh, authority. There won't be any more power. He will reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So when he comes, the last enemy is going to be destroyed. Death is going to be destroyed. The kingdom is going to be delivered up to the Father. Now, that means then that after that moment, there won't be anybody entering into the kingdom anymore. It has been delivered up to the Father. There won't be any death anymore. Why? Because that's the last enemy he's going to destroy. So it ought to be common sense that if death is still happening, he hasn't come yet. 
That ought to be self-evident. If he's, if he's already come and all of this has happened already, then Jesus is not reigning anymore. Listen, verse 27. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under his feet, it's evident that he who put all things under his feet is accepted, that is the Father. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, if the kingdom has been delivered up to the Father, and now Jesus has subjected that and surrendered all of that to the Father, then Jesus is not reigning anymore. And if Jesus is not reigning anymore, there is no more death. That's the last thing he's going to destroy is death. There is no more death since A.D. 70. Who can believe that? We all know on the very surface of it that that's the silliest thing we would say just by common sense is the silliest thing to think that death has been destroyed in A.D. 70. But it's worse than that. That means everybody has been raised incorruptible in A.D. 70. But even worse than that, it means that sin has been ended. Because sin and death go together. But if there is no more death, there is no more sin. Because sin demands death. And if death has been destroyed as the last enemy, then there is no more sin. You know, the thing that I've seen with some brethren who got caught up with this, believing that everything pertaining to the destruction of Jerusalem got wrapped up and consummated everything, what, what I've seen is that eventually... They will take their conclusions to a logical end. And when you take it to a logical end, you wind up either two places. You will either be a universalist who says, well, sin doesn't exist anymore. And therefore, we do not need to be saved anymore. We're all in good shape. And nobody's going to be lost. Well, that's the universal. And, and some of these brethren have wound up right there. The other place is you wind up completely rejecting the gospel as being necessary. The gospel can't save you unless you're lost. And you're not lost unless you're guilty of sin. And unless there is a death sentence hanging over you, you don't need to be saved. And so the gospel couldn't save you because it all ended in A.D. 70, according to these brethren. And since there is no sin, there is no need for the cross of Jesus Christ. We're all in good shape or we're in bad shape, but we're not a part of what Jesus Christ came to give us. I hope that this has been just enough for you to see. Well, yeah, I mean, it does wind up being very, very far-fetched. It does have some, some things about it that sound good on the surface, but when you start looking up close, it doesn't really, it doesn't leave you with any hope for anything. And some brethren say, well, where do these brethren go with this? I mean, do they think that, they're, that we just go nowhere? Do we go to heaven? Do we have a chance of going to heaven? Like I said... Some of the brethren haven't taken it to its full logical conclusion. So right now they still believe that if you're a Christian and you die, there just won't be a resurrection. You'll just go straight to heaven. So I will give them that. I will not say that they're just completely lost their minds. They do think that. They think that you just go straight. There won't be... A resurrection. There won't be a final judgment that we're just being judged as we go along and we go straight to heaven if we're a Christian and we go to hell if, we, if we're not. And so all of them are not there. But if you follow this, if you follow 1 Corinthians 15 and you follow it logically, you have to conclude 
that sin has been destroyed. Look at uh, chapter 15 again as he comes to verse 54. He says, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. When can we say death has been swallowed up in victory? When this, this corruptible has put on incorruption. And then we can say, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. So sin has to make it sting. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, sin is still our biggest problem. Death is still happening. We have both spiritual death and physical death going on right now. Jesus is going to put it all down when he comes again. But it's so important for us to be a part of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God to save us from all of this. It's still needed. The destruction of Jerusalem did not stop that. And so if this evening you never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you still have a chance. But you don't know how long that chance is. You've got until death or until Jesus comes back first. And you don't know when either one of those will take place. He's coming again and you are going to die. And you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You've never obeyed the gospel. Don't let this night slip away. Don't let it, don't harden your heart and let it go by without saying, I want a part of what Jesus died to give me, and that is salvation. If you need to obey the gospel tonight, please come and let your wishes be made known as we stand together and sing.